Well, thanks, Kurt. First of all, I'd like to thank O'Neill's for uh, obviously hosting us uh, here today as well as allowing me to talk about our program. Uh, and also, I'd like to echo the same sentiments that Coach Houston had mentioned with a, uh, thoughts and prayers to the Carrier family as well as JMU Nation and anybody that's come uh, to know Dr. Carrier. Um, so again, as a family, we'd like to, as our soccer family, we'd like to uh, echo those sentiments about Dr. Carrier. For us, it's been a very good start to our season. We actually opened up the season at a tournament at Ohio State, uh, playing against uh, FIU and Pitt, and Ohio State hosted the tournament. So for us to play in a tournament that has a Big Ten team, an ACC team, and a Conference USA team, and to uh, beat Pitt uh, and tie FIU was a very good start to our program. Um, so we also came back here and played Binghamton and we're victorious against Binghamton and suffered our first loss against Pacific who is currently six and one, ranked in the top 20. And I would assume that they will be closer to the top 10 by the end of the season. So it's been a very good start to our season and uh, we'd like to continue that success as well. Coach, what would you say the strengths of this team are, and, and where are they in comparison to where you wanted them to be this time this season? Well, we certainly wanted to get a good jump on the season. So from a win-loss record standpoint, we're, we feel very comfortable with where we are. You never want to lose a match, but to have lost a game to Pacific, that's, that's respectable. Um, it's a very young team with only one senior and five juniors, and it's a heavy sophomore team although six out of our eight incoming players have seen time on the field. So it's a young team, so you're going to have an ebb and flow throughout the season. Uh, but the nice thing was we had happened to have dropped two games in a row. We came back out to play uh, against um, our last match, and we won 3-0 uh, against Niagara. So it was a good response after the two losses. The other thing I like to say is we've played 24 total players out of 27 on our, on our roster. So we've been able to gain valuable experience in the first six games of the season, which will play out very nicely as we get into the conference play the rest of the year. Coach, what's the toughest part about having such a young team? I saw a couple of the sophomores made the box score in that last match against Niagara. What's tough when you have to put them pretty much into the fire right away? Well, the sophomores got a great opportunity to play towards the end of the season last year. Uh, last year when we started six uh, freshmen the last four games of the year, and we, were, we won all four games. So they, had, they were able to gain some experience last year, but the toughest thing to have a young team is you don't have a, a tremendous amount of senior leadership, guys that have been through the grind, say, three or four years. So you have to rely on the younger players, and they're very mature, very professional, uh, but you have to try to manage their emotions, try to keep them up as high as possible every day, every day we train, every day we play. Uh, but I'll give them credit. They've rose to the occasion. Uh, they come out to play every day, and they're very competitive. So it's been a, it's, it's a fun group to be around. Coach, you talked about being young, uh, looking back at those losses, and you don't want them. But are, were there a lot of coachable moments coming out of that for young guys to get adjusted to being collegiate soccer players? Oh, I see what you're talking about there. Those aha moments, if you will. Absolutely. Uh, Pacific was the only team that might have outshot us or outpossessed us. Every other team, we've taken 89 shots to our opponents, 45. So we've had an opportunity to be uh, more dominant in most of the games we've played. So to play against Pacific, which they had a little bit more possession than we did, more opportunities, although we pretty much matched them closely, actually, in shots on goal. But it was a good chance for us to see what an older, more mature team can provide as an opponent. So it was a great opportunity for our younger players to learn what it's going to take to get over the next hump to get into the NSA tournament. And then uh, the game against Navy, it's about getting a quick start. That was a day where we didn't get off to a good start in the beginning of the game. We fought back to tie the game, giving Navy credit uh, as they're supposed to defend our country when the time comes. A very gritty bunch, and they were uh, able to pull out the win at the end. But it's definitely coachable moments. Each one of our games, even in a winning case, we've been able to designate some coaching moments that'll help us prepare for the rest of the season. I know you still have Radford to come, but give us your take on how competitive the CAA will be this year for you guys. Uh, the CAA is extremely competitive. If you look from top to bottom, we've had a lot of success against outside teams outside of the conference in this part of the season. Uh, we've been very uh, successful against the ACC. We've been very successful when teams have played other teams throughout the country. I think all the teams got better in recruiting. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be an extremely competitive conference. I don't think anyone's going to run away with it. UNC Wilmington looks like the favorite at the moment. But as we can look back in history with the CAA men's soccer, conference. Anybody can beat anybody on every, any given day. So uh, I think it's going to be one of the more competitive conference uh, years in a long time. 
Coach, let's talk about recruiting. With the popularity of soccer over the last 25, 30 years, uh, a lot more kids are playing now. Who are you recruiting against? Is it more conference foes or not? Where's your footprint, if you will? How far are you? And, and are you recruiting? Is it, are you having to recruit while you're in season as well? How do you balance that? Soccer doesn't have a recruiting calendar, so we can recruit pretty much all year long. Um, we have found that it's changed a little bit, the landscape of recruiting, from a standpoint of when you had the original CAA, you were forever recruiting against George Mason, Old Dominion, William and Mary, all the teams in the state of Virginia. But our challenges right now is there's 11 Division I schools in the state of Virginia. So we're all fighting for the same kids in the state of Virginia. And not only that is the game has changed significantly with the introduction of the international player that's coming to college to play. So, and obviously our roster has uh, nine or 10 international players on it. So we're finding that we're not only recruiting against the top teams in the country, the top conferences in the country, but we're recruiting against all the other 10 Division I schools in the state of Virginia. Um, so it's an extremely competitive environment, but uh, so the landscape has changed since the CA has changed as well. Those international players that you're getting, uh, obviously basketball is one to get a lot of those. Are, are they coming stateside and playing in camps? Are you having to travel? How, how does that work when you, when you bring someone in from outside the United States? Uh, it's some of both. Uh, we try to see every player before we bring him to campus from a standpoint of bring them onto the team. So many times we'll travel overseas to recruit these players, just like we would travel to California to see a player in the States. We will always look at the in-state Virginia kid first, and then I'd say the mid-Atlantic, and then anywhere on the East Coast, and then anywhere in the country first. And then from there, we look at international players as well. But we try to see them as much as possible, but we recently had an ID clinic where we had about 14 out of 62 players flew themselves here for a single day ID clinic so that we could take a look at them. So it, it, the landscape has changed where a lot of the international players are looking and making strong efforts to come to the United States. Coach, when you have international players, I'm sure there are challenges. There could be some communication barriers just simply because of the language. And for some, it's just hard to even pronounce like Bjarke Edelsteinson and gentlemen mm -hmm. like that. But what are, what are the kind of the, the fun aspects that, are, that come with an international, very diverse group of, of just young men to begin with? Well, it's... One of the funnest things about the, the sport of soccer is being that it's played throughout the world is to try to balance all the different cultures where these kids come from. Uh, you certainly have a, a language barrier sometimes, but these guys are very adequate when, in the way they speak English. Um, but they, uh, I don't want to sound political, but the way I look at it is if we can get people from around the world to get on the same page to fight a common opponent, we're doing a lot what political people cannot do. So that's something that we're very proud of. Um, we're very respectful of all the cultures that these kids represent, uh, as well as, and I, you know, a lot of talk goes into the internationals, but we respect all the kids in the state of Virginia, the kids from New Jersey, the kids from New York. It's something that we do as a family. We bring everybody together as a family, and that's been one thing that's helped us. What's the biggest challenge for them as internationals to come and play the American college game? Mm -hmm. Probably the two biggest things they have to adjust to uh, is the referees, first and foremost, because the referees will call the game a little differently here in the United States versus where they're coming from overseas. And then the other part of it is sometimes international students underestimate the level of play at the college level from a physical standpoint, from an athletic standpoint, and also from a soccer IQ standpoint. So there, there usually is a little time to adjust to the way the game is played here in the United States. Uh, but most of the time, the international guys are pretty good about adapting to the referees, um, but, uh, but that's part of the biggest challenge is the athleticism in the game and the referees. Coach, you know, I remember you know, me trying to watch a soccer match on TV like 10 years ago. The only legal way you could do that is through pay-per-view or mm -hmm. go to a soccer bar, and I wasn't even old enough to do that. Um, I'm wondering, with the exposure of, of soccer now, especially with the Premier League and, and the UEFA Champions League on, you can turn on any channel anytime you want. Does your team watch a lot of that? Uh, do they do that together, especially with international players watching that? I mean, and what do they get out of that kind of shared experience? Well, it's... Uh there certainly can be a little bit of banter when the countries play against each other in international matches, and we've seen that a lot. But the guys, it's a very close uh, group of players. Uh, again, we stress it to be a family, so lots of times they will sit down together, watch a match. Lots of times you'll see them uh, because of the time of the game is lots of time in the afternoon uh, when they're televised here in the U.S., so they'll be in our locker room watching a game. Um, and uh, it does add for a lot of camaraderie, a lot of banter, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. Coach, a lot of people that are here this, this, evening, this afternoon have maybe seen the Dukes play, but many others have not. How would you describe the style of play that the Dukes are employing this year? 
under their third year head coach? Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, uh, one, carry, one statistic that I think is a very important one to look at is we've outfouled our opponents. Uh, let's see, where is it? Outfouled like 89 to 45. And some people will think that's lacking in discipline. But I look at it as we're defending. And we're going to make people feel very uncomfortable when they have the ball. So one of our biggest things that we've done this year more than, say, the past couple years is we're applying pressure on the teams when they have the ball at their feet. We, if we lose the ball, we want to get it back right away. If they have clear possession, we want to make them feel very uncomfortable so that we can have the ball more than they do. And so that's one telling uh, statistic that, uh, that's important to us. The other one is we have a very balanced uh, scoring sheet. Right now we have Ben Dow has got three goals, Joe Viner's one goal and four assists, Nicholas Moore has two goals and two assists, Billy Metzler has a goal and assist, and so we're, we're a very balanced team this early in the season, and that's again going to be something that's going to be fun to watch. We want to have an attractive attacking style, but we certainly want to make people feel uncomfortable when they have the ball. It's easy to, because the numbers aren't big, to just simply look at goals and assists, but who else on your team does a lot of the, the dirty work or the necessary connecting work that doesn't necessarily show up when you look at the scoring and assist column? Well, obviously our goalkeepers have done very well so far to start, having three shutouts this season so far. Um, two players that come to mind, one is on the score sheet, but Joseph Viner, who is our lone senior, has done a tremendous amount of work as a, as a striker, not only to create opportunities for himself, but create space for other players. Fernando Casero, who's playing in the midfield, he doesn't necessarily uh, show up on the score sheet, but he doesn't come out of the game. And he does a tremendous amount of work defensively, but also linking our defenders and our midfielders in the attack. Um, it's, it's definitely a team effort. Uh, Tim Esterman's playing fantastic. Um, Benny Dow, like I said, is off to a great start. Um, but again, it's with 24 players have played in a match for us out of 27, it's certainly a team effort. And we had the, the match the other night where um, Sean Connolly is your keeper, only really had to make one save. But part of that was because he kept his defense so organized with his communication that he never really got a challenge. And, and that's, that's part of the game that you, don't, you, don't, you really have to pay attention to to recognize. Well, it was a fantastic first start for him. And on top of that, when we played Niagara, we had five players that had their first college start for us at JMU. And to go out and win the game 3-0, uh, with controlling pretty much most of the, or all of the possession. But Sean had a fantastic game, and the best goalkeepers in the world will make it look easy, where they don't have to make a lot of saves because they organize their defense in a way that eliminates as many problems that could happen in front of them. And Sean certainly displayed that ability to do that with his defense. Any other questions from members of the media? All right. Coach Foley, thank you very much. Good luck the Dukes at Radford tomorrow night, and then at Elon on Saturday evening back home for their first conference home game a week from tomorrow, 7 o'clock. The tribe of William & Mary will be in town. Thanks, Thank Coach. You. Thank you.